Anthony, take it away. All right, thanks. Well, this is me. Um, so um, what I'm talking about is the Mosasaurus out of the, the, the first Mosasaurus out of the uh, Niagara, or sorry, the uh, Kansas in general. So I, I know what you're all saying is, well, Kansas, Mosasaurus, we've been finding Mosasaurus in Kansas for what, 150, almost 160 years. Um, the excavators came back, came out there um, during the Bone Wars. Uh, most of the work, though, in Kansas has all been in the Niobara, a little bit further to the east of where we're, we are digging. The Niobara chalk ranges from uh, Coniacian in age up to the lower Campanian. And uh, when we're looking at the Mosasaurus of the Smoky Hill member of the Niobara chalk, the really famous blue and yellow deposits out there, depending on who you ask, there's up to 12 species. I mean, uh, it depends on what kind of mess that Josh here resolves in the Cladastes lineage, whether Lyodontis, Propython, and Morvalensis are actually things or not. Um, but yeah, there, so there's a whole smattering of them over in the, uh, in the Niobara, which, you know, is what I normally work on. So, which is like sorcerer to me. I mean, that's why they pay me to just go dig holes in the ground. <laughs> okay, so we were on this slide. All right, so yeah, lots and lots of stuff out in the uh, in the Niagara Chalk when we talk about marine reptiles. So uh, Cope and Marsh both based out of Fort Wallace, Kansas, back in the 1870s when they went out on their digs. One of the reasons why is that Fort Wallace was an important army fort out there when they were developing the rail lines through there. So it was a protected area and they went out with an army escort for protection when they were digging. So you can see this is the Yale um, Peabody Museum with Marsh top center there. In 1872, heading out to Kansas when they were finding things like Hesperornis, Ichthyornis, all the fun toothed birds out there. Um, Cope went out there a little bit earlier, 1871, because back in 1868, uh, the surgeon at, um, at Fort Wallace found a bunch of bones. It turns out that it was the famous head on the wrong end Elasmosaurus that was discovered, um, which, uh, you know, again, was really instrumental in the, in the starting of the Bone Wars. We molded and cast the, uh, the Cope Elasmosaurus, um, and it's in co it, we have copies of it all over the place. Uh, this one right there, this is kind of a hokey kind of mashed together image, um, but that's, a, uh, that's at the National Science Museum in Guachan, South Korea. Um, their copies go all over the place. That's one of our main things that we do is make cast copies of these animals. So um, Wallace County used to be a lot bigger, but in the 1880s, Logan County was split off of it. Logan County is almost all Niagara chalk. Uh, Wallace County is all pure shale, except for like one gully way down in the southern part. Um, so it's there in the shaded version way on the western edge of Kansas, uh, bordering Colorado. The image, these images are from Ellis in uh, 1930. So our big site is over there where you see that fine little star. It, we are literally 11 miles from the Colorado border where we found these new specimens. So um, we're not the first people that went out there though. During the Dust Bowl um, and in 1930, Ellis went and had and studied all of the pure shale layers out there because the climactic catastrophe had conveniently removed all of the vegetation on the rocks there, so you could see all kinds of stuff. Um, he found uh, very few, few things um, outside of the Sharon Springs that, um, that looked like bone material, but he did find this. This was a Mosasaur specimen that went to KU in 1930. Um, it sat in collections, got shuffled around, um, unprepared, and uh, was completely forgotten about. It didn't even get an accession number up until about three or four years ago. So um, more of this to come uh, whenever anybody finishes working on it. But one thing to notice is a highly fragmentary and very concreted nature of this specimen, which is going to be important. One of the reasons why they ignored it ever since is after the Dust Bowl, everything grew back. And so this is your typical exposure in the West Can right now. It is, there's no topography to speak of. There's no, uh, there's no outcrop to speak of. But every once in a while, I find a few things that poke through. So we returned in 2014. So um, you see center is Brian Small, um, Jacob Jett, one of my coworkers. And then we kept Mike Everhart on the other side of the fence there. <laughs> 
uh, working on these things. And you, you'll notice though that the, the dig sites are not what you would normally expect for um, Kansas material. Um, the landowner at the Wally site, the first one that we exposed, had helpfully found a bunch of vertebrae and went ahead and trenched out the entire vertebral column and left it on the surface. Not ideal, but you know something that we worked with. Um, they put corrals around them to keep the cows off of the sites, um, which was great because it could, you know preserved the site pretty well. But the buffalo grass grew really, really well, and the roots penetrated the bones pretty badly, and that also was not ideal. But when we got there, we did find stuff that was in situ. So we found flippers that were in situ. Um, this is one of the uh, four limbs that was um, preserved on the Wally site and it's pretty nice. Tells us a lot of really cool things about the morphology of the animal. And when looking at the, the flippers, we're like, oh, this is a Mosasaurus. It's, it's clearly, you know, um, belongs to that taxa. The second site that we found, we can nickname Walker. I would like to introduce you to the front two thirds of the skull of Walker right there in the, in the outcrop. The, uh, again, highly concreted fragmentary specimen. Um, so that, which gives us a, an, and then lead into the title of my talk, which, um, yeah, so a uh, little meme right here, how are most stories like Chuck Norris? Uh, we have yet to test this hypothesis, but I'm pretty sure that they're pretty much the same. So sorry, ichthyosaurs with your mid Cretaceous, you know, dying off a bit, but the Mosasaurs were a little tougher. Um, oh, that didn't work very well. Um, so the initial excavation of the Walker site was productive. Mike Everhart came back out well, uh, with us again. He spent about three days looking for cephalopods out at the site so we could get a better biostratigraphic sort of idea of where we were. Uh, none whatsoever. Three days of looking at the ground, we couldn't find any. So we're going off of basically our um, where we are near the type locality, which is basically in the next ranch over for the West Can. Um, so looking at the site as, as it got bigger, you can see the skull block, um, the, the remainder of the skull block in white there already plastered up. Jacob, Jacob is at the tail, not on the tail. He's not standing on the tail. Um, and we dug it, the entire site basically had about 12 inches of, of material on there. Again, flippers in situ, and they turned out to be pretty nice. And they, actually this walker specimen turned out to be complete except for some of the, uh, some of the hind limb elements. The skull, though, was a little bit of a special challenge. Um, you can see a chunk of frontal over there. Um, the maxilla and premaxilla, when we started putting it together, that entire assembly there is probably 40 to 50 individual chunks that we had to glue back together. It was not great. Um, the back of the skull was a little more articulated, but if you notice, that is an entire 250 pound block of limestone that all these things are articulated in. Um, large animal. So what are we going to do? I mean, are you going to send volunteers or employees there with an air scribe and try to manually remove it all? But no, we did believed in better living through chemistry. <laughs> so this is uh, jo uh, Josh Lively, who's next up with me, and uh, Lee Hall, who we did the AMP um, workshop on acid preparation in 2019 at Hayes. If you um, participated in that workshop, you actually got to dunk part of the skull in, in acid. It was a lot of fun. So um, we did. We came up with a, uh, a solution. I mean, the bubbles always make things better, uh, but we came up with a solution that involved dunking it in sulfamic acid after the rinse, removing it, the loosened stuff manually with air scribes, uh, both Chicago pneumatics and HW type air scribes. Um, then blasting towards the bone with air abrasion to finish it up using dolomite, which worked really, really well. So, and after that, we were left with a bunch of chunks, but luckily all the chunks and stuff started to click together. So the lower jaws started from, you know, playing, playing card deck size pieces up to an almost complete lower jaw down there that's all gone back together acid, after acid preparation. The top of the skull, it still kind of ticks me off. There's a little bit of an area, I don't know if you can see it right there, that's missing out of, out of the top of the skull. I never did find that part. I think it's probably sitting out somewhere in a field in Kansas still. Um, but, um, but this is right when the pandemic hit, hit too. So it started and it returned to a work from home sort of thing. And in my garage, I was piecing this animal from chunks back together. 
Um, so it's starting to look a little bit more like a mosasaur. And by the time we were done, this is the skull with the main restoration only being the narial bar there on the premaxilla. Everything else is just real and three-dimensionally preserved. Turned out to be a pretty phenomenal specimen, this walker, uh, mosasaur. Um, that was sent to the customer uh, museum in Prague, um, which is it's under research right now and is going to be published on. The entire skull is about 1.2 meters long, so this is a big animal. And as you can see, um, for a mosasaur that um, mosasaurus that's very early, this is a very heavily built kind of a bruiser type mosasaur as well, not as gracile as say Cladastes. Um, after that. Um, we t since normally they frown upon taking any little bit of, uh, of, of distortion out of some of these um, real bones, we make plas plastic copies of it and then restore them into something that we can mold uh, later on. So Winifred had decided to help me with my, uh, with my reconstruction. One of the things I wanted to point out, uh, a little bit of a parallel here, is this mosasaur, um, slightly after the Sharon Springs uh, deposition, has very, very large eyes, has that nice little shelf that we had talked about earlier in one of our, in one of our talks here on the plesiosaurs, a little bit of convergent, convergence is going on here too. So I just, I thought that was kind of neat. After that, what we do is we take it and we chop it apart again after we put it all back together. It seems a little counterproductive, but when you're molding these things, you want to make it as easy as possible so you don't rip your molds when you're making 5, 10, 15 copies of it to, to go in museums across the world. So... That's what we ended up doing. So what do these um, skulls tell us? I, I went a little light on my lines there. I'm sorry on that one. But um, the, mil the West Cam formation is millions of years older than the current stratigraphic range of Mosasaurus. Uh, Missouriensis and uh, Conodon are about at about 75 million years in age or so. We are um, working at about 78 to 79 million years there at the lower west, west camp. So either, the, um, as suggested by Mike Polson, there's a weird temporal anomaly and we're getting mosasaurs sucked down way below where they should be stratigraphically, or these are really early big beefy mosasaurs that are showing up and we really need to study them. Um, they have a weird combination of derived and uh, primitive features in their teeth that we're seeing with their tooth counts, with the shape of their teeth, um, various parts of them. We have Walker line drawing at the top, the first, uh, the second specimen that we dug up. The first one down there is Wally. Um, and uh, that specimen actually preserves uh, pathologies from bite wounds on its maxilla, on its frontal. The first two um, alveoli on the uh, right lower jaw are just obliterated um, from, a, from a bite wound that it survived. So we can actually show antagonistic behavior in these mosasauruses um, in, the, in the earlier part of the campaign too. So, I mean, it takes a lot to do that. When you see an animal that's 10 meters long and you decide, I want to mess with that, you know, it's either you're, you're a really special kind of mosasaur or you know, there's something else going on. So... That's what we got here. So what's next? Um, currently, we are building the first prototype of the restored skeleton, complete skeleton of Walker. It's going to an exhibition in Japan. Um, should be sent off in about two weeks or so. So um, with uh, Mike Trebold for scale way in the back, taking uh, <laughs> taking some photographs of the, uh, of the laid out cast skeletons, not the original uh, material, you can, tell, you can tell that these are pretty massive animals. And so, you know, we'll, we'll be able to do a little bit of uh, work on these to figure out what the heck is going on. Because uh, when you find your first Mosasaurus, um, when they're supposed to be pretty closely related to Cladastes, which, which gets up to maybe five or six meters long, usually on a good day, and you have these, suddenly you have 10 meter giants um, running around shortly afterwards. There's something weird that's happening between the Sharon Springs and the West Can deposition. Um, and we really need to look into that a lot more. So I wanted to thank a lot of the people that gave me some help on this uh, talk. Mike Everhart, of course, for tirelessly and fruitlessly looking for cephalopods when we were out there. Mike Polson, Josh Lively, um, Takuya Kanishi, Halley Street, and of course, Ike as well for um, just letting me bounce questions off of them um, when we were working on this uh, Mosasaur reconstruction. Uh, that's about all I got. All right.